Aztec sacrifice, 14th to the 16th century AD. Who were the Aztecs and why was human sacrificing so important and central to their society? The term Aztec is a modern day invention to describe the various tribes who make up the Mexica kingdom. They rose to prominence there during the 9th century and their empire peaked in power and culture from the 14th century until the 16th century when the Spanish conquered the region, devastating and destroying the Aztecs once and for all in an incredibly short space of time. Ritual sacrifice and self-bloodletting was central to the lives of the Aztecs. Ingrained through ritual and tradition into the Aztec psyche, the concept of blood sacrifice was at the very core of their beliefs. They felt they owed a debt to the gods, one the people should continue to pay every day, otherwise the sun would not rise. The Aztecs firmly believed that the sacrifice of the deities at the beginning of time led to the very creation of the universe, while other gods sacrificed themselves in fire in order to breathe life into the sun. The Aztecs believed in many gods and deities, but by far the most important was Huitzilopochtli, the god of sun and war, who demanded blood in order to be appeased. So individual bloodletting became a daily ritual for the Aztecs regardless of the age, gender, or social standing of the victim. Animals were also regularly sacrificed in both private and public. Quail was always a popular choice to use, but they also regularly used dogs, eagles, jaguars, and deer. And certain deities such as the feathered serpent Quetzalcoatl required the sacrifice of butterflies and hummingbirds. Though what really drew the community together was public human sacrifice. They would sacrifice people in public, often prisoners of war, with great pageantry and ritual by the high priest. Such was the demand for human sacrifices. Scholars cannot agree on an exact figure, but believe it was between 1,000 to 25,000 a year. Aztec warriors in battle would often wound an opponent rather than kill him in order to capture him and bring him back for human sacrifice. It is widely believed that many of their wars were motivated by the need to gather more victims and as a way of intimidating neighboring states. They would normally kill these victims by the use of a sacred sacrificial dagger as it was believed their blood would give life to the sun, each drop slowly reviving it in order to give it the strength to rise again each and every day. The freshly cut out heart would then be placed by the priest in a stone vase and was either incinerated and offered to the sun for it to consume or was eaten by the high priest. Often these victims for human sacrifice would impersonate a deity and their sacrifice would mimic the one that the god had once given in the past. They were dressed up and acted like the chosen deity and were treated by others very highly like they were celebrities. Their title was seen as a true honor and after they had been executed their body parts were eaten by the people, often the ruling class, in order to please the gods even further. One particularly gruesome ritual would see prisoners of war dressed up to look like various gods who would then be sacrificed, have their hearts cut out, and their skin flayed from their dead bodies. Their skins would then be worn by the priest as a costume to represent the deity. The festival being held determined how the sacrificial ceremony was carried out, as the Aztecs were a complicated people with an advanced social culture. A common thread throughout these sacrifices was that the heart of the victim would be cut out and the still pulsating organ would be held up high for all to see. At the very center of the Aztec religious world was the Great Temple, which was an impressive pyramid with twin shrines on top, one for Tlaloc, the god of rain, and the other for Huitzilopochtli, the god of war. It was situated in the Aztec's capital city of Tenochtitlan, which is New Mexico City today. Here, countless human sacrifices were carried out by the high priests. Normally, the heart of the victim was ripped out and then the corpse was beheaded, dismembered, and then the lifeless body was thrown down the steps of the temple to fall 180 feet to the base of the pyramid below. The heads of the sacrifice were then put on skull racks at the base of the temple. This sacrifice was a mythical reenactment of the story of the sun and war god, Huitzilopochtli, who took his sister, the moon goddess, Coyoshalki, dismembered her body, and then threw her down Cuatopetl, the sacred serpent mountain. In the reenactment, the steps of the temple doubles for the Serpent Mountain. Most sacrifices at the Great Temple were prisoners of war or slaves, but also children were sacrificed as their tears were deemed to be linked to Tlaloc, god of rain. 
These traditions went on for hundreds of years, until March 1519 when a Spaniard by the name of Hernan Cortes, heading a small expedition, invaded the Aztec Empire. Within two years, the Aztec Empire had crumbled, conquered by the Spanish, and its population decimated by smallpox. With this and the arrival of Christian missionaries and their powerful backers, many of the Aztec ways and rituals of human sacrifice were confined to the pages of history, once and for all. But occasionally, despite the Spanish invaders trying to eradicate this practice and all monuments to it, some artifacts have still survived to this day, including ceremonial skull towers and skull racks. George H.W. Bush, the president who avoided being eaten by cannibals in World War II. George Herbert Walker Bush was the last U.S. president that served in combat. There were a number of his predecessors who also paid their debt to the country, but George Bush's experience was completely unique. He managed to evade the gruesome death of being eaten by Japanese soldiers. When the Japanese forces attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, George Bush was only a 17-year-old teenager he was attending the last year of the Phillips Academy University Preparatory School in Andover, Massachusetts. In the days after the attack, the people of the United States experienced a rush of patriotism. It was the same case with young Bush, who wanted to enlist as soon as possible so he could serve his country. Since he was still underage, his first idea was to enlist in Canada, but he changed his mind due to his strong wish to serve as an aviator in the U.S. Navy. As soon as he graduated and turned 18 on June 13, 1942, George Bush signed up for the U.S. Naval Reserves. One year after he joined the Navy, he was commissioned as an ensign. Many believed at the time that he was the youngest pilot in the U.S. Navy, as he was only 19 years old. It didn't take long when in the spring of 1944, he was sent as a pilot to the USS San Jacinto light aircraft carrier. He arrived just in time to participate in the campaign of island hopping against Japanese-held islands in the Pacific. Still a youngster, George Bush became an experienced pilot after fighting over Marcus and Wake Island. He also participated in one of the largest air combats in the war, the Battle of the Philippine Sea in June 1944. In the final day of the battle after returning from the mission, Bush had to make a forced landing on the water. It was his first crash in the war. Luckily, he and his crew were rescued by the destroyer USS Clarence K. Bronson. The second one, however, was far more dramatic. As American forces were rolling northwards on the Pacific, they commenced a campaign on the Bonin Islands in August 1944. It was the same month when George H.W. Bush was promoted to Lieutenant Junior. On September 2nd, Bush received an order to fly in a group with three other bombers towards the island of Chichijima. Their mission was to destroy a very important radio tower that was located on the island. As soon as they appeared in the skies over the island, they were attacked by the strong anti-aircraft defense. Bush's plane was hit at the moment when he started to dive towards the target. Neglecting the fact that his plane was on fire and the entire cockpit was full of smoke, Bush continued to dive until he realized the bombs had hit and damaged the radio tower. It was only then that he turned his blazing plane towards the USS San Jacinto once they were far enough from the island, Bush and two other crew members bailed out of the plane. As he was descending, Bush observed his plane hitting the water and disappear into the waves. Moments after, as he hit the water, his struggle began. With a heavy, soaked flight suit, wounded head, and eyes still burning from the smoke in the cockpit, Bush had to fight to stay on top of the water. His fortune was that he landed in the vicinity of a life raft. When he got a hold of it, he inflated it and climbed aboard. The misfortune was that the winds were pushing him closer towards the Japanese-held island, so Bush had to paddle with his arms to stay as far away as possible. At one point, he was spotted by the Japanese who sent boats to capture him, but these were repelled by American fighter planes. For four hours, George was floating in his raft as fighter aircraft were flying above his head to protect him. Finally, he was rescued by the lifeguard submarine USS Finback. Several other airmen were shot down and also escaped by bailing out, but they would not be so lucky. Those eight aviators who were captured suffered severe torture from the Japanese squad on the island. They were either beaten or stabbed with sharp bamboo sticks, after which they were killed. The most horrifying part was that the bodies of four of them were used to prepare a meal for the Japanese officers. 
by the wish of Major Sueo Matoba, Japanese surgeon Dr. Teraki removed the liver from one of the dead U.S. pilots and handed it over to the cook. He then prepared it with soy sauce and vegetables and served it in small pieces pierced with bamboo sticks. Major Matoba, in the company of other officers and commander of the island General Yoshio Tachibana, feasted on this gruesome meal with sake. They believed it was good medicine for the stomach. The same feast was repeated with the body parts of three of the other aviators. At the time, Bush knew nothing about this crime that was kept secret even though the executors were eventually trialed in 1946. It was not until 2003 in the study published in the book Flyboys, A True Story of Courage, that George H.W. Bush and the entire public learned of the terrible destiny of the captured airmen. In November 1944, Bush returned to the USS San Jacinto and continued to fight over the Philippines. After a few months, his entire unit returned to the States due to heavy casualties. And in September 1945, George H.W. Bush was honorably discharged from duty. Even though he flew 58 combat missions, had 126 carrier landings, and 1,228 flight hours, the mission over the island of Chichijima was one that earned him the Distinguished Flying Cross. As he later claimed, these were the moments that he remembered for the rest of his life. How You Survived the Real-Life Battle Royale of Nazino Island, 1933 if you're not yet familiar with this horrifying story, here's a brief overview. It was a failed Russian penal colony set up by the Soviet authorities to house undesirable minorities. Political prisoners, rich landowners, petty and hardened criminals, and basically anyone caught disobeying the regime. It was located on a small uninhabited island on the River Orb in the remote and barren wilderness of western Siberia. This was an extremely short-lived project, closing down just a month after it opened in May 1933. So, could you have survived a month in this chaotic hellhole? Well, your odds of surviving this ordeal are going to be about one in three, so thousands of you are going to die before the project is over. And even then, survivors will at the very least be severely malnourished, traumatized, and mentally scarred for life as the sad reality is that many of you had murdered and eaten other participants in order to survive. At the end of it all, there is no cash prize or early releases, just a transfer to a settlement colony or a gulag to endure years of further misery. But at least you're not one of the 3,300 who died or mysteriously disappeared during their brief stay on Nazino Island. So welcome to Joseph Stalin's Island of Death. Challenge 1. The Boat Trip of Doom You have to survive the four-day, 500-mile journey to the island. On this trip by boat, you were given one thin blanket and a meager daily ration of just five slices of bread a day, which is less than 5% of the recommended daily caloric content that an adult needs, so you're already starving to death. Survival Tip Keep a low profile and figure out who's best to team up with. If you have anything of value, trade wisely, as what meager resources there are will only go up in value in the coming weeks. The items you should be looking for are a knife and matches. They'll soon be crucial to your survival. Death rate. One in 20 of you did not survive the journey here. Remaining prisoners? 95% of the original settlers are still alive and will go on to the next stage. Challenge 2. The Anarchy Segment With only a handful of poorly trained and under-equipped guards, law and order will quickly break down on the island. The guards will therefore retreat to the tip of the island with what little stores there are. Now, for the prisoners, this whole ordeal will become a case of survival of the fittest. Survival Tip Anyone that you're forced to kill or who just dies, remember, don't forget to remove anything useful from them before anyone else does, such as gold teeth or fillings, as these will be useful to barter with and to bribe the guards with for flour. Death rate? Around 1 in 20 of the prisoners will die from gang-related violence before this is all over. Remaining prisoners? 90% of the original prisoners are still alive, but that number will drop dramatically with each passing day. Challenge 3. Surviving the Cold 
the battle to survive the extreme cold will become a constant struggle, where even the daytime temperature on the island will rarely be above freezing, especially as there's over 5,000 of you on this swamp-filled island that's just one square mile in size. The prisoners end up burning hundreds of the few trees that were available each day just to keep warm, with none to spare to build any kind of rudimentary shelter. Within weeks, the island is suffering from severe deforestation, and wood, along with food, are now the most precious commodities on the island. Survival tip. Always be foraging for timber, as your fire cannot be allowed to go out as you may not have the means to ever relight it again. Strip the dead of any useful and dry clothing, burning anything useful as potential fuel like dirty underwear and hair. Also, make it a priority to try to keep your hands and feet warm and dry or frostbite will set in in no time at all. Not an easy thing to do on a freezing, cold, swampy island. Death Rate Around 1 in 10 of the prisoners will succumb to the freezing cold, as well as hundreds who will get frostbite, losing fingertips and toes, and often leading to deadly gangrene and blood poisoning. Remaining Prisoners 80% of the original prisoners are still alive, but living conditions are unbearable and all food and natural resources have been totally exhausted. Challenge 4. The Invisible Killer Soon, the island will be gripped by typhus and dysentery due to poor sanitation and contaminated drinking water. Symptoms include bloody diarrhea and projectile vomiting. This will prove particularly deadly as by now most of the prisoners have a weakened immune system due to malnutrition and hypothermia. Also, avoid wading through the island's many swamps as they contain numerous nasty parasites and are infested with mosquitoes. Survival Tip Avoid drinking the river water or the snow at all costs unless you can boil it. Try to collect rainwater if you can as it's your safest source of water. Death Rate Around 1 in 10 of the prisoners will die of a variety of highly infectious diseases. It's not helped by the fact there's absolutely no medical facilities or treatments available on the island. Remaining prisoners? Around 70% of the original prisoners are still alive, but ill health is now rampant all across the island. Challenge 5. Escape is futile. You may decide to try to escape in order to get away from all this misery. Though this may at first seem like an easy option, as the 40 or so guards don't bother patrolling the perimeter of the island, especially as many of them have no proper coats or boots themselves. But if they realize that you were attempting to escape, then they would just shoot at you for sport. But first of all, you would have to get across the few hundred feet of freezing cold and fast-flowing river that separates you from the mainland. And you don't have the luxury of building a trustworthy raft, as you have no proper tools whatsoever, and timber is now an extremely short supply. Nevertheless, many tried and hundreds drowned in doing so. If you did get across, you would have to travel hundreds of miles across a frozen wasteland to find the nearest civilization, enduring temperatures below freezing and savage, prolonged blizzards. Also, beware of the inhospitable wildlife that includes aggressive brown bears, snow leopards, ravenous packs of wolves, and deadly Siberian tigers, all of whom want to make you their next meal. Sadly, there are only a few species for you to hunt, like the arctic hare and the vicious-looking musk deer, both of which are incredibly fast and almost impossible to catch. Survival Tip Frankly, don't even try to escape, as the odds are stacked up against you. There are no records showing that anyone has ever made it to safety. But if you must try to escape, find a couple of dead, bloated bodies. There will be many to choose from as the island's shoreline is littered with dozens of them. Find some that still have any kind of body fat on them. Cut it off and smear it all over your clothes in order to make yourself a bit more waterproof. Then use a couple of other really bloated bodies as flotation devices to get across the river. Note, you now have a new problem. You are now safely on the mainland, smeared in dead human fat, but there are natural predators prowling around with their heightened sense of smell. Death Rate Around 1 in 10 of the prisoners will die desperately trying to escape the island. Remaining prisoners Around 60% of the original prisoners are still alive. Challenge 6 Slowly Starving to Death The real killer round has arrived. After the very first week, you have already used up all of your body fat, so it's now crucial that you find food. If you don't eat every few days, you will not have the energy to stay warm or even move around, 
then you are as good as dead. The small supply of flour that was brought with your group is almost gone. Also, the island has already been picked clean of any nuts and berries, and any root vegetables have all but gone. And the rat population on the island will all be consumed in the next few days by the thousands of equally hungry and desperate settlers. Also, fishing in the fast-flowing river is difficult, especially as you have nothing to make improvised fishing equipment with. So, your body is already entering the phase where it's breaking down muscle tissue to produce much-needed energy. A healthy person could survive several weeks without food, but in your weakened state combined with the bitter cold, you'll be lucky to survive seven days at best before you die. So, by the second week, cannibalism started to appear, and by the following week, it's commonplace, with all other food sources becoming exhausted. Survival Tip Remember that if shoes and handbags are made of leather, they can be boiled and made soft enough to eat. Also, wood, if ground up into a paste and boiled, can be eaten much like a porridge. Though both will fill up your stomach, neither has any real nutritional value. Death Rate Around one in four of the prisoners will die of starvation or will be eaten by fellow participants. Remaining prisoners? Around 35% of the original settlers are still alive at the end of the four-week challenge, though over 3,300 are dead or missing. Survival tip. If you have managed to keep a branch or a bit of wood from the beginning of your stay on the island, you can sharpen the tip of it by rubbing it patiently against a rock. If you have a fire, place the sharpened tip of your weapon over it, turning it until you see the wood change to a dark color. Continue doing this until the entire point is completely baked. By using this hardening technique, the tip will be made much more durable. This weapon can then be used for hunting, fighting off predators, and also for protecting you from being eaten by other prisoners. After a month, it all ends suddenly when there's a change of policy back in Moscow. Most of the survivors spend a long time recovering in hospital before being transferred to settlement colonies or gulags. In Soviet Russia, there must always be someone to blame. So, a few minor officials and guards were arrested and were quickly found guilty of incompetency and corruption and received prison sentences ranging between one to three years. Then the whole matter was hushed up and not made public until the 1980s. The Cannibal Escape Australian Penal Colony Prisons are notoriously hard places to get out of, with their high walls, locked doors, searchlights, and guards everywhere. But what if your prison was a penal colony in Australia back in the 18th and 19th century? For all they needed to keep the convicts in were a few guards, as the surrounding barren wilderness or shark-infested ocean would deter even the most aspiring escapee. So if you were going to escape such hellish conditions, you'd have to be extremely tough and determined. The harshness of the situation demanded it and probably the most gruesome of all escapes involved a convict named Alexander Pierce. Pierce was an Irishman who had originally been convicted for stealing six pairs of shoes. He was sentenced to seven years in an Australian penal colony. Since arriving in Van Diemen's Land Penal Colony, Australia in 1821, he had been nothing but a troublemaker. While there, he continued his crimes and was further convicted of numerous offenses, including stealing ducks, turkeys, and a wheelbarrow and twice was found guilty of being drunk and disorderly. And his latest conviction was for forging an order with the intention to defraud. For these crimes, he was repeatedly given a lashing and on one occasion was sentenced to six months on a chain gang. Finally, in 1822, he was sent to Sarah Island. This penal colony was one of the worst of them all, and you were only sent here if you had been disruptive at one of the other less strict penal colonies. For Sarah Island encampment was on a desolate, windswept spot next to the island's harbor and was surrounded by a vast jungle. Despite all this, shortly after Pierce arrived there, he already managed to escape into the jungle with seven other convicts. The escapees headed towards the settlement of Hobart, 90 miles away, but after 15 days they were hopelessly lost and hadn't eaten for days, so the group felt they had no choice but to resort to cannibalism. The first victim was an easy choice for the men. Alexander Dalton was an unpopular member of the gang because, back in the penal colony, he volunteered as a flogger where he whipped the other convicts. Deranged with hunger, Robert Greenhill grabbed an axe and smashed it into Dalton's skull. The gang then feasted on his organs and flesh. 
At this stage, two of the group, fearing they might be next, decided to leave and went their separate ways. The remaining members of the group drew straws, and Thomas Bodenham drew the shortest one. He knelt down and was killed by an axe blow to the back of the head, then was subsequently served up as lunch. It was a week later and starvation was looming for the group once more. A fight broke out between two of the convicts. It occurred when John Mathers was foraging for roots in desperation to find something to eat. Greenhill crept up on him and attacked him, presumably to try and eat him. This led to the rest of the group joining in the fight, resulting in Mathers being killed and becoming the next meal for the three remaining hungry group members. Then, a few days later, a group member named Matthew Travers was bitten on the foot by a venomous snake and died after a prolonged fever several days later, after his wound had become gangrenous. He became the two remaining group members' next meal. Now, only Alexander Pierce and Robert Greenhill were left. They both vowed to work together in order to get to civilization, but their trust soon evaporated and one night Pierce butchered Greenhill with an axe. Pierce then continued his journey alone, on the way raiding an aboriginal campsite for food in order to survive. Finally, he reached civilization and soon ended up falling in with a gang of sheep rustlers. But after nearly four months on the run, Pierce was recaptured and consumed with guilt, confessed to the murders and the act of cannibalism. But such was the disbelief of his story that the authorities simply didn't believe him and sent him back to serve an extended sentence on Sarah Island. This might have been the end to the story, but a few years later in 1824, he escaped again with the help of a fellow convict, a young man named Thomas Cox. A few weeks later, further down the coast, a ship stopped to investigate a beach fire and found Pierce eating him. Pierce ended up confessing no less than three times to his crime of cannibalism before his execution once to the magistrate, then to the base commander, and lastly the night before his execution to a priest. Each time the details differed slightly, but the overall message was always the same. He had killed or taken part in killing his fellow escapees and ate their bodies. It was said he showed some remorse for having done these wicked deeds. Subsequently, he was convicted of murder and cannibalism. He was hanged for his crimes on July 19, 1824. There is no record of what he requested for his last meal. Elizabeth Bathory, the countess that bathed in the blood of her victims. Hungary, 16th and 17th century. In Hungary, 1514, the Doja Rebellion, a bloody peasant revolt led by a nobleman called Georgi Doja, nearly succeeded in overthrowing the country's aristocracy. After this failed rebellion, the aristocracy needed to maintain their grip of power, so they passed a series of laws giving them unlimited control over the people. To set the example, severe punishments were handed out to the revolt's leader. Doja was forced to sit on a boiling hot iron throne-like chair and wear a red-hot iron crown while grasping a scorching royal scepter until he died from burns and shock. So when the Countess Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7th, 1560, she was born into a world where the nobility had absolute power over their people. She would be the product of inbreeding between Baron George Bathory and Baroness Anna Bathory. Elizabeth had three siblings, one brother and two sisters. The family was one of the wealthiest and influential in the kingdom, ruling Transylvania as a virtually independent principality. The Countess grew up to be well-educated with a good understanding of mathematics, as well as learning to speak fluently in four languages, her native Hungarian, as well as Latin, Greek, and German. She was engaged at a very early age to the son of an influential baron, who she then later married at the age of 15. It is said around 4,500 people attended the wedding. Elizabeth received Kachicha Castle, a 13th century fortification situated in what is now modern-day Slovakia, as a wedding gift from her husband. The couple had at least five children, but only three survived infancy. Her husband, Count Ferenc Nadazdio, nicknamed the Black Knight of Hungary, was now a general and was often away fighting in the Ottoman Empire. His military career was highly successful, and in time he rose to the rank of chief commander of the Hungarian army. It is said that Nadazdio, like Vlad the Impaler, who was the inspiration for Dracula, liked impaling Turkish prisoners alive on giant wooden stakes and then enjoying watching them die a slow, painful death. 
1601, the Count was struck down by an unknown disabling disease and three years later at the age of 48, succumbed to the illness and died. He and the Countess had been married for nearly 30 years. Shortly after her husband's elaborate grand funeral, Elizabeth went on and did something quite odd. She took a trip to Vienna for an extravagant shopping trip and spent a vast fortune on the finest clothing for her and her servants. After her husband's death, Elizabeth went against Hungarian tradition, where the convention was that the widow retires from public life for a year and mourns quietly in private. She was a public figure, getting involved in anti-Habsburg politics and tried to collect debts for six years, owed to her husband and herself from the Vienna court. And though she was now the head of a family of great status and privilege, dark rumors had started to circulate about other aspects of the Countess's behavior. Over the next few years, allegations of the Countess's atrocities became increasingly serious and spread throughout the kingdom. Even a Lutheran minister called Istvan Mayargi complained about her behavior to the royal court, but was ignored. But by 1610, King Matthias II could not ignore the situation anymore and assigned the Palatine of Hungary, her cousin by marriage, Count Georgi Terzo, to investigate the allegations. After a long, thorough investigation and taking over 300 witness statements, what Terzo discovered defied belief. It seemed that the Countess had been killing young girls, numbering in their hundreds, allegedly starting as far back as 1585. She was arrested later that year, and there was also physical evidence to support her alleged crimes. This was in the form of survivors and mutilated dead, dying, and imprisoned girls found at her properties at the time of her arrest. According to official record and testimonies given by witnesses, the atrocities she was alleged to have carried out were the abduction of numerous young girls, mostly between the ages of 10 to 14, and torturing them to death, taking part in cannibalism, and murdering 80 of her victims. It said that the true figure could be between 36 and 650. The accounts of the atrocities often mention girls being severely beaten, burnt, the mutilation of their hands, the biting of flesh off their faces, arms, and other body parts, and freezing or starving to death. There were even allegations of hot needles being used, as well as girls being burned with hot tongs and then being plunged into cold water. There were also claims that some girls were regularly whipped with nettles, while others were smeared with honey and then left to the mercy of the ants and wasps. There were infamous vampiric stories of the Countess drinking and bathing in the blood of her virgin victims to retain her youth. These accusations were recorded many years later and are therefore less reliable. The Countess was promptly put under house arrest and soon afterwards put on trial. But the trial never concluded. Even though King Matthias wanted the Countess found guilty and then sentenced to death, Terzo convinced the King that such an act would adversely affect the standing of the nobility in the country. Due to political reasons, the trial was abandoned and the Countess was placed in solitary confinement in her castle. The maids who assisted her in conducting those murders were not so lucky. They were convicted and executed for witchcraft. The Countess was kept bricked up in a set of rooms within the castle, with only small slits left open for ventilation and the passing of food. Terzo was to note in his journal that she would suffer solitary confinement without light and without crucifix. She remained there for three years until her sudden death on August 21st, 1614, at the age of 54. Some people think she was set up, as the king and many others owed her large sums of money. Therefore, discrediting her in such a manner was an effective way of getting out of paying their debts to her. Many relatives were envious of her wealth, and as she was relatively young, they felt that they might never get their hands on the inheritance in their lifetime. Though there is some truth to these claims, it's generally accepted that she was a power-crazed sadist and serial killer who was allowed to indulge her every whim due to her status and power in Hungarian society.